if we were to talk to all of you, everybody has a food story. And yet, in our own lifetime, and I think that is the saddest part of what we are seeing today, in our own lifetime, food is becoming sterile. It is becoming processed, fast. And so the big issue for us, as part of our work is, how do we bring the flavors back? Food, in our view, is not just about taste. It is about taste, but it's not just about taste. It's about nutrition, it's about safety, and it's about biodiversity. And that's really what CSC's work, what we call all our work on good food. Our work on good food is about making the link with nutrition, with safety, and many of you know we test um, antibiotics recently in chicken, we tested potassium bromate in bread. We keep doing that and we will keep doing that because we believe food safety is an integral part of the new food culture we want. But the big global challenge that we are dealing with today is the irony. I think that the biggest irony of the world today is that you have this twin <coughs> challenge. On one hand, you have undernutrition just less than a billion people with undernutrition. And on the same side, you have overnutrition. Over two billion adults today, obese, suffering from disease because of the food they eat. And in a country like India, and that's the saddest part of our, the double burden as we keep saying, we have both. And that is why the hunger and the obese they're both connected to looking at food. It's about food, is about production, what we grow, how we grow it, and also who grows. All three questions are important. What we grow is about the diversity, the wisdom of crops that were water prudent. Today we talked about millet, Riaz, we talked about millet. But the fact is, millet were eaten because they were the most water-wise crop. We talk about crop per drop today. We need to change diets for that. Because if you want to save water in this country, you cannot be eating rice where you should not be growing rice. Kerala, you need to grow rice, but not in other parts. But food is also about consumption. What we eat, how much, and who decides diets. You know, most of us, the urban literate audience, hate to be told that we are manufactured people. We believe we are totally in control of our food choices. But I, with all the work that we do, my colleague Chandrabhushan is here, who heads our work on the laboratory, and all the work we do, what we are realizing is that actually we are the most foolish generation possible. Because our food habits have actually been created. <coughs> From convenience food to processed food to the very emergence of snack food as we know it today. This is really what you would call social transmutation that has happened. And it's happened to all of us. We are the products of designer food and our takeover is silent but complete. There's a fascinating book written by a journalist in New York called Salt, Sugar and Fat, where he details the history of the food movement, food habits as they changed in the US. And for somebody like me, who was also growing up in that same generation, I read with such horror that the person called Betty Crocker, that we all sort of, you know, must have, many of us are in that generation, would have known about <laughs> Betty Crocker. She was invented. She was invented deliberately to destroy Betty Dixon, who was the head at that time of the Home Economics Association of the United States, and was promoting the culture of good food and home-eaten food across the country. It was inconvenient because you needed to have processed food, TV dinners, convenience food. And so the big food industry invented Betty Crocker, who obviously was a woman who never slept. She could whip up a cake in a jiffy and all without any sweat. 
and this was deliberate it was it fed also in some senses as a woman and i think about it whether it's been the tobacco movement tobacco industry or the food industry they have played on feminism deliberately and they have both created a culture of saying that it's about the convenience of not having to cook not saying that everybody needs to cook the man and the wife both need to cook but to say if you don't want to cook your tv dinner your processed food is the answer and that's really what has happened generation in terms of changing our habits and think of what you ate and what you eat today whether it's the double refined oil whether it is the very white rice these are all we are manufactured we our lives our minds have been taken over and in and at a time when we know that bad food is bad it is very clear that bad food lifestyle is the problem in the world salt sugar fat is responsible for obesity related diseases there is more than enough evidence that this is part of the problem in the world it is not any more something that we can shoo shoo and say it's something we'll deal with later we cannot afford it obesity is a global pandemic related to what we eat and who manufactures processes and feeds us that food as our new lifestyle and so all is not well what we need is smart regulations for this new food generation and this is really what csc is pushing towards we are saying we don't want to first contaminate our food with pesticides toxins antibiotics and then clean up this is unaffordable this is expensive this is the elite organic food movement that we should not be asking for food has to be affordable growing food and organic food has to be affordable which means that you first don't contaminate and then clean up you also don't create good food by first destroying livelihoods of small marginal farmers and then worrying about how you're going to feed them you don't endanger biodiversity and then worry about how you're going to deal with pests or climate change and that's critical because remember biodiversity is the intelligent system of nature tomorrow we have a pest problem it's in the gene pool that you will go back to look for the answers when climate change and it is happening today the only way to deal with it is to have that gene pool alive for us to find the diversity which will help us cope through changing climates so you don't first destroy biodiversity and then worry about all this and you don't first deplete groundwater and then worry about drip irrigation so what we are pushing for is this new generation food regulation where we are saying we need to design food cultures for a different culture which is linked to safety to nutrition to livelihood to biodiversity but today what we are here for and i'm really grateful to sanju and soresh for a green it's a wonderful thing for us because you bring together a different community uh, and that's the joining of the dots we need as well because at the end of the day food is about diversity and we as environmentalists say you cannot value biodiversity in the wild if you don't value the biodiversity on the plate if you lose the biodiversity on your plate you will also lose it in the wild and that's the environmental connection to food that we need to drive down and make more and more part of our lives because if we lose that culture we lose nature and my colleague vibha has put together what we call the first food volume 2 it's about leaves it's about flowers it's about fruits and vegetables it's about seeds it's about how we preserved all this and it's also about a new business that is celebrating food diversity in india so if you look at leaves we've had told me this i have um, after my accident i always have 
ate some things and she said, this is what I should be eating and I should eat it in my dosa because if you take this herb and put it in your dosa, it's actually what medicinal and it's also delicious. You have flowers that you could eat. I mean, I didn't know a harsingar could be eaten. And yet, if you look at the diversity of flowers and the way we cook them and the way we ate them, the value that you give to that nature is so important. In this case, you make a healthy dal out of it. Falsa is something that many of us know. But what we try and do in the book is link the nutritional aspects of the food as well. Because at the end of the day, it's nutrition, medicine, it's diversity. And then, of course, it is taste as well. Seeds, um, chakia from the hills uh, to make uh, um, into uh, with potatoes. And then, of course, there's a whole business of preservation that we talk about in the book, uh, which we need to understand. Because at the end of the day, Amitabh, the, the reason pepper was so much the gold of the world was it was the preservative. You didn't have deep freeze at that time. So it was pepper which kept the meat preserved. And that's the whole tradition of food that we need to rediscover again. And we need to make the connection with livelihoods. To me, that's the most important. Because at the end of the day, I remember last book we talked about Makhana and we talked about the disappearing wetlands of North India. Because if the wetlands disappear, Makhana will disappear. And Makhana will disappear because the wetlands have disappeared. And with climate change, you have more and more uncertain weather. You need the sponges of this country to be able to hold the rain. And that's why the connection between the makana, the wetland, and the livelihoods of people who collected the makana, who collect the makana even today. In this book, we talk about jackfruit, amazing tree. The productivity of jackfruit is just incredible. And in the poorest tribal forest areas of India, this is the major source of income. And if you could build a food culture which values this fruit, which values the livelihoods of the people who bring you this food, then you make for a new culture in itself. So at the end, in our view, food is about livelihood, as I said, the business of growing, collecting, storing, selecting, and improvising on seeds. And it is that selecting and improvising that brings the taste and the value. And you cannot replace it with the mono-industrial culture of food. And that's why culinary tradition is about diversity. Food is also about nutrition. You can relish flavor, enjoy smell, taste, but not have the goodness of health. When you look at junk food, this is empty calories. You get food without nutrition. That's what we need regulations to make sure that we do not have first obesity and then discover the value of nutrition. But most of all, food is about wisdom. It's about people, it's about crops. I talked about the water prudent crops of <coughs> India. Think about the nitrogen fixing trees of India. The Khejri of Rajasthan gives you both the nitrogen fixing for the crop, it gives you the seeds which are eaten and the leaves which are fodder. This is agro silvo pastoral economies. And these will only get celebrated when we celebrate the value of that knowledge that brought it to us. So that is really what I, at CSC we want to be able to push the nature's tapestry which we need to learn from, live with and not replace. And finally, food is about culture. It's about our lifestyle. And in India, this is where I think we still have a chance to do it differently. Most other parts of the world are today rediscovering organic. We are organic. Today, most people are discovering home-cooked foods. We do have home-cooked foods. We don't first have to eat bad and then learn the value of good food. It's in our farms, our kitchen, in our table now. So if we can celebrate nature, nutrition, 
and make the connection with food, we will go a long way. Thank you very much.